Larry King now, Grammy-nominated artist Cascade on the booming popularity of electronic music. It's very much the sound of right now. It's a very current sound. It's what's happening. Um, so kids are listening to it. On his new album. I think sonically it's a step forward for me, certainly. Um, it feels very new and fresh. Um, you know, I'm always trying to like push myself. Plus. 50,000 Japanese kids and I'm like, hey, and I'm saying this in Japanese. What did you say? I said, hey, I, I don't know if you guys know this or not. Speak some Japanese. I said, mo, mo karanai, mo tabu ni mo karanai kedo, Tokyo ni sundemashita. I used to live here in Japan. And the crowd goes, bah! I mean, they just like flipped out. That's all next on Larry King Now. King now, our special guest is Cascade. After decades as an underground genre, electronic music has ascended into the mainstream and has become a multi billion dollar industry. For multi Grammy nominated singer, songwriter, producer, and DJ Cascade, a 15 year veteran in electronic music, this relatively new fervor over his genre has been a long time coming. Following recent headlining gigs at major musical festivals like Coachella and Lollapalooza and a residency at our famed Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, Cascade's new album, Automatic, will be released on iTunes September 25th. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How would you define electronic music? Some call it party music. Is that fair? Uh... Yes, there's a lot of partying that happens to electronic music, um, but it's more than that. I mean, I think that's the surface. You know, when you scratch the surface, you're going to get, sure, party music, pop music. Um, but it's been around for a long time, so it has a rich history, and there's a lot of depth in there. Um, Did it have other names? Uh, house music. Uh, that's what I grew up calling it, house music. In Chicago, we called it house music. And then I think as it kind of got older and you know, more and more people were discovering it. it was just being rebranded and remarketed as different things. Um, and now people call it electronic music. Is it a young person genre? Yes, it is. Um, I think it's very much the sound of right now. It's a very current sound. It's what's happening. Um, so kids are listening to it. That's who's catching on. But aren't it. there many right nows? Country is right now. R&B can be right now, right? <laughs> Sure, I mean, countries right now for somebody who's growing up in Nashville, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, but I think electronic music's always spoken to a more urban crowd. Um, it was something that was happening in the cities. And um, as it kind of, you know, as it aged, it, it, it spread out and more people found it and found nightclub and uh, night culture and were going to the city and taking the trains in and the buses in and going and discovering this music at nightclubs. Billboard has called you one of the most powerful artists in electronic music. According to Forbes, you're one of the top 10 highest paid DJs and producers. You've never had a radio hit, right? No, I haven't. Right. How, how did you get into this? How did you discover electronic music? Uh, I was a kid growing up in Chicago. Um, and I just was really curious. I was a music lover. I had two older brothers. They were going into the city, going clubs. And uh, there was a particular teen club called Medusa's that catered to younger you know, teens. And uh, their format was house music. It was a very forward thinking nightclub. And uh, in the 80s, house music was had an explosion in Chicago. It was massively popular. But it was really just happening right there in Chicago. A little bit of it was like leaking into New York, and was, New York was starting to happen, and they were having their version of it, and Detroit was having its version, London was kind of having its version. But it was uh, relatively small, and it was just in these you know, handful of cities. Um, but I came across it, and to me, I think just the rawness and the realness of it, um, it was accessible. So how did you, would you, were you a DJ first? No, I was more of a dancer first. I kept going to these shows and these parties and kind of, uh, you know, integrating myself into the culture and just learning about it. Um, uh, Frankie Knuckles, who's kind of like one of my heroes in this community, um, a Chicago guy, I was going to his shows in the 80s and I was just really learning from the guys who started this entire thing. They were the first generation. I'm part of the second generation that came along. I saw what they were doing and was intrigued. 
Um, and back then, the technology was really expensive. A drum machine was a couple thousand dollars. A turntable was, you know, a thousand dollars. So it was really expensive stuff. So I couldn't get into it at that time. I was just a kid. You know, I was like mowing lawns for ten dollars a pop. I couldn't buy a turntable or a sampler or these pieces of equipment. It was not until later when I got into college, had a part-time job, and I saved up and bought the equipment and started Did you go getting to school? into it. Uh, Brigham Young University for my first year. You're uh, Mormon, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. You have. I'm married to a Mormon. Yes. Yeah, I'm a devout Mormon. Yes. So you have three children. Three children. Yeah. Was BYU worth it? Was it uh, a good school? It's it was an known, amazing school. I not ended up known for music. Not known for, for music. Except for the Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> That's true. The, the choir is a big deal. Um, I mean, for me, it was just. It was a time of discovery, like most kids who go to college. I left Chicago. Here I was, like, taking the train into the city and listening to house music every weekend. And I got to Utah, and I was like, OK, there's no house music here. Um, if there's going to be any house music, I'm going to be the person that's going to bring it to did Salt Lake. Did you bring it? I did. I did. Salt Lake is now very hip. Yeah, it's a cool place, and they've got a lot going on. Um, it's almost secular now. Yeah, and I mean, I brought crates of records with me to school, like every kid does. Back then, you know, vinyl was the format that people were still purchasing. You know, this is about the time that we were, you know, moving into CDs. I was still like a vinyl junkie. Um, but, you know, my friends in the dorms were like, oh, rad and that crazy guy is always playing records and doing his thing. So I started throwing my own parties and doing, you know, doing what I do. and got into it. There's been some backlash from longtime electronic fans, I'm told, that the genre has gone too mainstream. Do you share that? I mean, what does too mainstream mean? Well, you got, I understand you were criticized from re, for remixing a Justin Bieber song. Yes. What did you do to the Justin Bieber song? Um, when it comes to a remix, a lot of people are constantly asking me for remixes. Uh, my criteria is, do I like the original song? And for that song, it was, yes. It, I actually really love that song. It's a song about faith. So to me, it spoke to me personally. When you remix it, what do you do when you remix it? Um, it's reproducing it. I mean, all they give me is just the vocal stem. So there's no music attached to it. So I recreate the, the accompaniment that goes with the music. Reharmonize, do, do whatever. Oh. I mean, I sped the tempo up quite a bit. It was a slow song. I sped it up, um, um, reharmonized it, and, and put it into a version that would make it playable in my show. Um, that's kind of the second piece of the criteria. Like, can I use this in my show? How often do you work the wind? Quite a bit. This year I've been there a lot. I was just there yesterday. Great place. Yeah, Mr. Wind's been very good Steve's to me. Steve's a great guy. Yeah. Coming up, what can Cascade fans expect from his forthcoming album? Stay with us. The new album is Automatic. This, the guest is Cascade. You just signed with Warner Brothers. When you did, you said, I don't need the factory behind me. I just need someone to help me get my music heard by as many years as possible. How did the Warner thing come about? Um, I was finished with my deal that I was in, and I was kind of shopping around and talking to a lot of different people. Um, and kind of what we spoke about earlier, a lot of people were criticizing electronic music for going too mainstream, and I didn't want to get in a deal that somebody was telling me what to produce or how to make my music. So uh, what was most important to me is to find a partner that was going to just kind of amplify what I was already doing instead of trying to mold me into their pet producer. Um, Cameron Strang, who runs Warner, came over to my house. Um, he lives over on the west side. And my studio is located at my house. And he came into the studio and um, really cool guy. And he's just like, you know, what's your deal? What are you about? You know, what are you trying to achieve? And I laid it out for him, and he's like, you know, this is how I can help you. And, and it felt very authentic. The fact that he'd come to my studio and hang out with me and talk about fly fishing. He's from Vancouver. I was going fly fishing um, <laughs> at that I time of year. So, so we were talking about fly fishing. I'm like, this guy's really cool. He understands what I'm trying to do. This is the right place for me. So what will we hear on Automatic? Um, you know, it's the next chapter in my story. This is my ninth album, uh, my ninth full-length uh, album. And really, I think sonically, it's a step forward for me, certainly. Um, it feels very new and fresh. Um, you know, I'm always trying to, like, push myself. Do you um, sing on any of the numbers? I, I do sing on one of the songs, We Don't Stop, which is kind of the theme of the record for me. When I listen back to it, I'm like, what's the theme here? What was I really trying to get out and all these ideas? Uh, what's the title mean? 
Automatic for me was, I've been doing this a long time and I was thinking about it. I'm like finally at a point in my life where I've never second guessed anything what I've done. And just like, you know, automatic. I, I wake up, I make house music, I sleep, I eat, I go play a show. It's very automatic. This is automatic. For me. Yeah, I this is it. what I do. Your music is associated with drugs like Molly and ecstasy, party drugs. A lot of people associated with party. You're a man of faith. Yep. Are you living in a dichotomy? <laughs> There's an element of that, yeah. Sure. Um, How do you deal with it? Drugs, uh, to me, it's never really been in my face and I've never been asked to, or no one's twisted my arm and said I had to behave this way to be a part of this scene. Um, to me, when I grew up as a kid in Chicago, it was always very open and honest and people were like, hey, this is where people who are different are accepted. Um, you know, taking the train into the city, the kids in the suburb where I grew up were, you know, stealing their mom and dad's pot and smoking it or buying a keg and having a party at you whoever's are. house. And I was taking a train to the city and going dancing. And my parents thought that was pretty cool and fairly innocent, and it was at the time. I mean, it was just about having a good time. So have you ever had to deal with it where it was an affront or hard for you? For example, do you ever have to play any music, deal with any lyrics you didn't like? No. So you've never let that... No. You've never let the two collide. No, it's never, it's never really been a problem. I get asked this occasionally, and it's just, for me, it was always about the love of music. You know, I think, I think in electronic music, it's the same as it is in country, pop, you know, hip hop, whatever it is. There's certain elements that just circle around those, those genres of music, and parting is part of the landscape of electronic music, but it's not that you have to be high or drunk or acting stupid to be successful. How do you explain the explosion of the DJ, the big money, the top DJs get the kind of money artists get? What makes a good DJ and why is it, what is the talent? I, I think that differs from each guy who's had, I mean, everyone's got a different success story. David Guetta, Steve Aoki, you know, these guys all have different stories of why they're successful. In What's my yours? case, in my case, it's been singing, writing, and producing, mainly writing songs that people connect with. Um, you know, having a theme and, and, and an idea and being honest with who I am and just putting that out there in the music, telling a story and having people you know, tune into that. But say some years back, DJs DJs just mix music, right? Sure, yeah. Or they, they were a this, personality on the radio, yeah. yeah. And I mean, DJs really the kind of I think it's a, a tad <laughs> insulting to, for what's currently going on, and you know, in this in this world. Um, you know, I write and produce music, but yeah, sure, I'm a DJ. I mean, that's that's a small part of what I do. Um, I like to think that people. You know, my fans know more of me than that. They've listened to my albums. You know, I've poured my well, heart and soul. When Steve Wynn puts a billboard up and says Cascade, yeah. they're coming to hear you play that record and frolic to it, right? Yes, and I think that's where we are in today's world. People don't really, they don't care what the performance is. The fact that I'm up there on a laptop or in, four, in front of four turntables or CDJs or whatever the equipment is I'm using to perform, I don't think that's necessarily what they're all about. They, don't, they are there for a show. You know, if I'm DJing, cool, that's great. If I'm up there singing, I mean, I think they connect to the song It's all a performance. Way. It's right. all a show, yeah, it's just part of the show. What do you make of Paris Hilton becoming a DJ? Um, Have you heard her? You know, it? Paris is a friend, and she's she friend would come to my shows, a lot of my shows, and come and hang out, and... Uh, I think a lot of people that are, you know, getting into the DJ world because it's so popular now are, I mean, I think ultimately it makes me look better because this is what I dedicated my life's work to. It's like not everyone can be a talk show host, you know, but everyone thinks they might, that they can, it, you You've know? never had a cop out, right, For you, to your own morals. Me? No, no. I mean, I've stayed true to your who I am, yeah, and what I'm about. More with Cascade after this. Great pleasure to have Cascade with us. Automatic is coming. This will be your biggest, right? Now that you... I believe so. Oh, this will be the... All right. David Guetta was here just after performing at Coachella, where you did as well. And he said Coachella is the best festival in the world. Do you agree? Yes. 
All right. Why? Um, I think it's like the festival, you know, the ultimate festival. It's the music lovers festival. It's, I think the programming's always been extremely progressive. They, they put everything on from rock or hip hop to electronic music. I think coming from my world, they've always been uh, extremely welcoming of electronic music, which is cool. I mean, for me to play the main stage this year was just one of those huge moments. And uh, there's not a lot of festivals in the world that'll do that. Like, okay, what does this guy do? What is he about? But um, Coachella's been very progressive that way. Like, oh, this guy's got a humongous fan base. Let's put him on the main stage. And How it was many the right call. there when you're performing? Um, it was the largest crowd to date that Coachella's ever had at any stage. Uh, I don't know, somewhere 80, 85,000. It was massive. I mean, honestly, to this day, I can pull up the drone footage and my eyes pop out of my head and my jaw drops. It's just unbelievable to me. Um, How do you reach out to that bigger crowd? You know, I spoke more on the microphone than I ever do. Typically, I just like let the music speak. Uh, this is what I do. I'm always like playing music, and each one of those songs have a story, and I'm trying to weave that together to make something interesting. Um, but that night, uh, standing in front of that crowd, and this is kind of like a hometown festival for me. I've you know spent the last 15 years of my life in California, and uh, quite a bit of that here in Southern California. So. You know, I just picked up the microphone and talked to him. Is every performance different? It is. Yeah. What was Lollapalooza like? Again, another like kind of heart wrenching moment. That's to Chicago. Right? Yeah, it's just Chicago. I mean, my mom's there. Um, my my entire family's there. Um, you know, kids that I grew up with, went to high school with. Um, so to see them out there and. Um, it's cool because I get choked up and they get choked up and it's just like this big moment where we celebrate the success of Are you going to play thing. Coachella next year? Uh, probably not next year. They're very, um, like I said, they're very progressive. They don't like to book the same act twice, a, twice in a row. So it'll, it'll be a few years. Uh, this year was my fourth time playing it. So I've wow. been going back and back again. I'm sure I'll, I'll be back there, but not so soon. We're going to play a game of If You Only Knew. I'll just throw some All right. questions at you. All right. Favorite city to perform in? <laughs> oh, man. Whatever I, answer, uh, whatever I answer, the kids are going to kill me. They're like, what? Uh, Chicago and L.A., San Francisco, I don't know. Between the three of those, it's a tough, tough Do you thing. perform in Salt Lake? I do. Yes, I do. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Oh, man, to never age. <laughs> Forever young. Yeah, not right? bad. Remember the first girl you ever kissed? Uh, Stacy, I think her name was. Chicago? Yes. How old were you? Seventh grade. One thing you could change about the world if you could. Oh, man. More peace and harmony. Uh, your lips to God. Yeah. <laughs> your favorite electronic artist of all time? I'm going to go with the Chicago legend, Frankie Knuckles, the, the gentleman I spoke earlier about. A newer electronic artist you're impressed with? Uh, Trent Moeller. He's relatively new. I mean, he's been on the scene for a, a little while, but uh, he's continually um, pushing the boundary and, ins and inspiring me. What makes a good one? What do you look for? Uh, sonically, I think the music just has to be interesting from the first minute I put it on, something that I've never heard before. Um, and that's part of what makes electronic music interesting to this day. Um, you know, you're, you're relying on computers and synthesizers, drum machines, and, and to manipulate that sound to make it something that, you know, try and make something that nobody's ever heard before. Do you ever remix an artist of the past, uh, Sinatra? Yes, I have remixed Sinatra, yes. It's awesome. He was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Turned <laughs> out great. I mean, it's hard to make something amazing better, but I, I, I tried my best. Crazy fan encounter. Oh, man. <laughs> Got a lot of those. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I almost was trampled to death in Mexico City one time, but uh, it was a fun night, and I love playing in Mexico City, but they it's got a little too city. excited, and then the, the wall came crashing down. So. An artist that you'd love to collaborate with? Uh, Sade has been somebody I've always loved her voice, and I think she has something really special. Pet peeve. 
after a show, getting in the car, and the driver's got the music blasting. <laughs> Excuse me, um, can we turn that off for a minute? <laughs> a type of music or artist that you listen to that may surprise people? Um, I'm a big fan of like 80s alternative music. In my car, I listen to that a lot. Yeah. Really? Yeah, alternative yeah. 80s? Yeah, yeah, like Echo and the Bunnymen, the Smiths. I'm a huge fan. New Order. This is stuff that I grew up listening to as a kid, you know. The Smiths, they had that lead singer that was Morrissey. just... Yeah, Morrissey, yeah, yeah. Morrissey Morrissey is him. absolutely amazing. He was amazing. He's a poet, this guy. Uh, he's uh, a I wonderful think, uh, He's one of my favorite songwriters of all time. He's definitely... Great singer, a, too. He's yeah, it's unbelievable. And a performer. I mean, this guy, like no other. I've seen his show many, many times, so, yeah, I'm a big fan. Your most cherished memory? Um... A handful of them. Meeting my wife, Naomi, uh, the birth of my children. How old are your kids? Uh, 12, 10, and 5. Got my hands full. Are they fans? <laughs> yeah, they are, but they think Diplo is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's the flavor of the moment. They're like, Dad, we want to go to DJ Snake. When I went to Coachella, they wanted to go to DJ Snake and Diplo, and I was like, all right, all right, well, we'll get to Snake. Don't worry about it. We'll get to DJ <laughs> Next, we'll wrap things up with some fan questions for Cascade from the social media aspect. Don't go away. We're back with Cascade. Automatic is coming. It'll be uh, released on September 25th. Have you signed on for any music festivals that your fans may not know about yet? No, oh, man. There's a lot coming up. Uh, I'm doing Lollapalooza in South America, uh, Chile, Argentina. Um, Sao Paulo, that's a big one uh, in the winter. Well, their summer, our winter. Are you going to tour Asia? I am. I got Asia coming up. Uh, I mean, the biggest thing I've got coming up is the automatic tour. Uh, almost the entire month of October, I'm here in North America uh, with some really big shows. Uh, San Diego, uh, New York, Chicago. You still get to go to church every Sunday? When I can. No matter where you are? When I can. Oh, you're going to get back to Tokyo then? I've been back to Tokyo many times. Oh yeah, the best, that's, that's another amazing memory. I was at a huge festival in Tokyo and uh, picked up the microphone and it was great because I, you know, I jumped up on the table and everybody was like, what's this guy gonna say? You know, all 50,000 Japanese kids and I'm like, hey, and I'm saying this in Japanese. What did you say? I said, hey, I, I don't know if you guys know this or not. Speak some Japanese. I said, mo. I used to live here in Japan. And the crowd goes, bah! I mean, they just like flipped out. And I didn't plan on saying a whole bunch, but everyone on my team, the guys behind me are off stage, like, talk some more, talk some more. They're freaking out. And I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know what else to say except that I lived here and I love you guys and I appreciate your support and thanks for coming out here, you know. Here's some questions from fans on social media. Uh, Sioban on Facebook, what's the weirdest thing you've seen a fan do at a show? <laughs> I'm always intrigued when people like throw their underwear or bra or panties <laughs> up at me because I'm like, you know, it'll hit me in the face or something. I'm like, I, is that a request or what? <laughs> I don't know what they're saying to me. <laughs> Michi Rara on Twitter, how has Cascade's heavy use of social media changed, evolved with EDM and his audience since he first started? Uh, that's a great question. Um, when I first started, it was kind of like living in a bubble, you know? It was like I'd put music out and it was hard to get any feedback. I didn't know what was going on there. You know, I'd go and talk to the label and they'd be like, oh my gosh, we sold 7,000 copies of the record, the vinyl, 12 inch. And I'd be like, wow, that's great. Or is it? I don't know. Is that bad? Is it good? You know? So I, did, I couldn't, there was no feedback really, it just except when I'd go on the road and play shows. But now it's like I pull out my phone, I jump on Twitter or Facebook, you know? And people are talking to me all the time. There's a constant dialogue happening. You know, if I choose to join in and, and participate, it's a lot of fun. I can speak directly to people. Uh, Mandy Lean on Facebook. What is your favorite book or piece of literature or writer of all time? Uh, Catcher in the Rye. Me too. Phonies. I, out there. <laughs> I love Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, it was read a big it, one. Read for it me. different stages too. Yeah, I've read it a few times. Yeah. R. Duran on Twitter. Will he bring back live vocals to his shows like he did on the Atmosphere tour in 2013? Um, maybe uh, when I tour and when I do my own shows and then my own concerts, it's a little easier to do that. 
Um, people were really excited last year or two years ago when I toured for that album, Atmosphere. I came out and I sang Atmosphere. The title track was me singing. And I'd never done that before. But I'm like, oh, it's appropriate. I'm on the Atmosphere you know, album tour playing the Atmosphere show. And I have to come out and sing Atmosphere. There's no other way to start the show except for that. It's made a lot of sense. We'll see if I do it in the future. I don't know. Uh, Brian Tran on the Larry King Now blog. How difficult is it to balance your touring life, bouncing from city to city or country to cutty, country, with your life at home with your family? Um, it's challenging. Uh, but I'm constantly reminding myself what's important, and my wife and I spend a lot of time you know, dealing with that challenge and balancing the time and schedules and when will you come with me and when will the family be able to travel with me. Um, I'm always looking for opportunities to bring my family with me and to keep them around and keep them close by and spend as much time as I possibly can with them. Koichi on Facebook, given that a few of his songs have been used in some big name video games like GoldenEye and Grand Theft Auto, is he an avid gamer himself? I'm not. I don't have, I don't have, I, I love video games, but I just don't have time for it at this point in my life. Yeah. Zach Morton on the Larry King Now blog. Were you expecting such large crowds at Coachella? Do you think maybe the crowd was possibly too big? I, no, I wasn't expecting that large of a crowd. Nobody was. I think that was kind of a, you know, it was a big moment in my career. Um, I knew it would be big because Coachella has always been a very successful moment for me. But um, too big? Yeah, potentially. I think it's so hard to connect with somebody who's 250 yards away, you know, a couple football fields away. Because um, to me, I think the music works best when it's extremely loud and, and encompassing the fans. And, and it's because that's part of what electronic music is. It's very loud. It's, it's quite rowdy at times. You have a problem with your ears? Um, Yes, I'm sure I've lost some hearing over the years. I mean, I've spent 20 plus years in a nightclub. So, uh, yeah, I mean, nothing to speak of, but yeah, I'm sure I've lost a little bit there. Uh, Koichi on Facebook. Did he enjoy his time in Japan while there on a mission? And did he like going back? Loved it. Tokyo is an love amazing about city. It? Um, the people extremely kind and gracious and very giving even when I first got there and I couldn't speak Japanese very well at all people were so kind I mean to get on the train it was like no you know hey can I help you in their broken English they would like go out of their way you know here's this massive city that can only be compared to me in my mind New York you know people are hustling bustling and you know 8 30 in the morning and struggling to get to their jobs and like somebody would without a doubt Hey, can I help you? Do you need some help? Do you need some assistance? Where are you trying to go? And that's just the kind of people that they are. They're very helpful people. Um, the food is delicious. And the fact that it just felt so different from anywhere in the world I'd ever been. I mean, honestly, when I went from Chicago to Tokyo, it was like, it was like I was in some other universe, you know? Did they accept you knocking on their door and preaching the faith? They did. They were quite accepting. Um, People wanted to talk. I think we're at a time when people like to sit and discuss faith. Xanax on the Larry King Now blog. What advice would you give to DJs and producers just starting out? Uh, find what you love and stick with that and master that part of your craft. I mean, if it's like, if you're a really good songwriter, spend more time developing that and, and really stick to that. Uh, if performance is more where you shine, then get more shows, get more gigs, do as many of those as you can and make yourself better and get as good at whatever, whatever is sticking out to you and whatever's your natural place, try and amplify that. What do you do best? Well, I've been doing it for a long time, so I like to think I do a lot of things really well. <laughs> um, I think my shows are part of why I've been so successful. The mix. I think they translate really well and people connect with that. And then I think second is songwriting. I think the stories that I've told over the years have really connected with people and that has grown and people learn to love the music. A song that I wrote 13, 14 years ago is just as popular to show today um, that it, as it was 14 years ago. And that's just, there's not many guys in this space that can say that because the uh, electronic music is so sonically driven, you know. Great pleasure meeting yeah, you. Yeah, thank you.
Thanks for having me. Cascade, I want to thank him. Great guest. His new album, Automatic, is available on iTunes September 25th. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at KingsThings. I'll see you next time.